Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching a brand new edition of India's World with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Sri Lanka's president suspended parliament on Thursday until May 8th, days after a failed no-confidence motion attempt against the prime minister and the defection of several ministers forced a cabinet reshuffle. A government decree quoted the president as stating that he had halted parliament's meetings with effect from midnight Thursday under Article 70 of the Constitution. The move came hours after at least 16 Sirisena loyalists, including six cabinet ministers, said they would leave the troubled coalition. Relations between the rival groups in the unity government have soured after both suffered losses in February's local council elections. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe's United National Party had increased pressure on the followers of Sirisena, who voted against Vikramasinghe in a recent no-confidence motion to resign. On this edition of India's World, we will analyze the political situation in Sri Lanka. Joining me on the program today are Vivek Kartu, former ambassador, Professor S.T. Muni, foreign affairs expert, and S. Venkat Narayan, India Bureau Chief, the island Sri Lanka. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of India's World. Mr. Narayan, I'd like to begin with you first. What's the situation like, the political situation in Sri Lanka? See, it's uh, a bit tense at the moment. We have to go back to 2015 when Sri Lanka had a presidential election. For the first time in the history of that country, two mainstream political parties, UNP and SLFP, got together with the primary aim of throwing Rajapaksha out of office. And it was decided that Sirisena, who was hoping to the prime minister, but Rajapaksha did not make him in the previous regime, he would be the president and uh, Ranil Vikram Singha will be the prime minister. And that is how they had a, a victory. The UNP and the SLFP faction led by Sirisena. And, but uh, <clears throat> I think there is internal struggle for power between the two mainline parties. Now, Rajapaksha, sorry, uh, Vikram Singha and Maitripala Sirisena they should have been working together to execute the Yaha Palayana, that is good governance. But that is not happening because obviously UNP supporters of Vikram Singha are putting pressure on him to expand his uh, you know, base and Sirisena who had said that he was going to contest for the presidency only once, now he's thinking of contesting for a second term. And he's trying to get as many people from Rajapaksha's faction to his side. Mm. So there is a tension between the two. And Vikram Singha has not been taking Sirisena into confidence and discussing things before taking major decisions. And the president is very upset about it. That's why he has been divesting main portfolios from Raj, uh, Vikram Singha's, uh, you know, uh, uh, control. So there is obviously a lot of tension and it sure. came to a halt. I mean, it, it reached a, a, a blow up point when both the parties did very badly in the uh, the local elections. Uh, Indeed, in you know, that's a, that's a point that I want to take forward. You know, Professor Muni, do you think that both the leaders, after facing the setback in February in the local body elections, that, that has been playing on the minds of both of them in what's happening right now? Well, it has been playing on the mind, but I would again uh, say that the two leaders did not really gel together even after the formation of the unity government. I think Sirisena thought that he is still a devoted SLFP and he doesn't want a new combination uh, in, in, in uh, you know, collaboration with the UNP and form a new system, uh, uh, give a new political culture. And uh, Ranil Vikram Singhe somehow ran into problems into his own party, where there are many of his members who, do, who somehow do not like him, because he has been uh, leading for a very long time. Therefore, you have a situation where the leaders are not in command of their parties, number one. The parties have a lot of disaffiliation vis-a-vis -vis their leaders. And in the process, they have forgotten the national agenda, which brought them to power. Surprising, though, that uh, the no, no uh, confidence vote, which everybody thought is very heavily pitted against the prime minister, uh, in fact, was carried in his favor. And that is a, I think he's a master strategician to that extent, 
that even Siri Sena's uh, word, and he wanted Prime Minister to be defeated, uh, to his own SLFP people, uh, did not carry the day. Uh, and uh, uh, Ranil's own opponents within his own party, who decided to vote against him, at the last moment were literally forced to think that they will vote for him. And then he got the Tamil votes, because he is seen in Sri Lanka as someone who is moderate on the Tamils, who wants a constitutional solution of the Tamil problem, and he has far more humanitarian approach uh, to the uh, 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 Tamil issue. Uh, therefore, today we stand at a situation where there is a lot of flux, there is a confusion. The vote has been won by the Prime Minister, but not necessarily uh, that the problems have been resolved either. So the unity government stays, but let us keep our fingers crossed as to how long they continue. Okay, we have fingers crossed as to how long they continue. Ambassador, is there a political crisis in Sri Lanka? I think clearly the coalition is fraying. And uh, the present move of the president seems to be only to buy time so that he can do some maneuvering uh, to strengthen his position. But if you look at this in a larger perspective, it shows that the that the Sinhala uh, are now fraying among themselves. And there are three poles clearly. There is the Rajapaksas, is Ranil and Shri Sena. And it is very difficult to say how all this will ultimately turn, up, turn, around, uh, turn about. But one thing is certain, that Rajapaksa is back where perhaps he had wanted to be at this stage. And uh, he must be watching these developments uh, with some satisfaction. Uh, what will happen over the next few months is difficult to predict. If the Chirisena and Ranil want to keep Rajapaksa out, and the defeat in the, in the council elections was overwhelming. So, if they learn a lesson from that and they want to keep him at bay… They don't seem to be learning a lesson at least as of now. Exactly. So, if they don't learn that lesson, then they are in grave difficulty. Uh, but if they do and they realize that the quote-unquote enemy at the gate is, is there, then perhaps for some time they may gel. And it's, it's quite possible that uh, for that the, that the move to sus, prorogue parliament is meant only to ensure that some uh, attempts at bringing about a rapprochement, however temporary, uh, could be undertaken by the president. But in all this, as of now, the president is at his weakest. Okay, the president is at his weakest is what you're saying. Does this mean that the door is wide open for Rajapaksha to, st st to stage a comeback, Mr. Narayan. In a manner of speaking, Rajapaksha is actually knocking at the gates of office. The constitution forbids him from trying for a third time, but nothing prevents him from becoming the prime minister. Okay? So it's very important for their own survival that Ranil become a singer and Maitri Palasir is Sena, come to an understanding, work together, and see the presidential term through till the six-year term gets over in 2021. Yes. You see? So, whether they are going to be able to make this happen or not, for their own survival, it's very important. But if they don't gel or they don't learn how to work together, they are in trouble and Sri Lanka is in trouble. Why do you say Sri Lanka is in trouble? Because the Chinese have invested a lot of money and already Hambantota airport has practically been handed over to the Chinese and uh, they have a huge stakes in the Colombo airport also and they, you know, they are into a lot of things and hoping that the Indian Ocean Islands like Maldives and Sri, Sri Lanka will become a part of this one belt, one road uh, mechanism. Initiative, see? yes. So, um, if they do not work together, they will have to have elections. In my view, there is nobody really in Sri Lanka today who can replace Vikram Singha as Prime Minister. Karu Jaisuriya is no match. 
Chandrika is not interested. I don't know whether she, if somebody invites her, whether she'll go back. I'm not so sure if she is popular with the electorate. So they have to somehow learn to work together as a team and move on. Otherwise, sure. they'll be in trouble. So what's at stake uh, uh, for India, Professor? Well, India wants stability to begin with. And a stability which is uh, sympathetic to our concerns and sensitivities. And to that extent, the present unity government is the uh, understandably best option. Because uh, I, I am not very sure if uh, Rajapaksha is almost knocking at the door. It so seems. But he represents a very die-hard singular nationalism. And uh, it is this uh, singular nationalism or the singular constituency which stands further fragmented in, di in different leaders. And people remember that Rajapaksha not only stood for singular nationalism, he also stood for a family rule, for, for autocracy and all kind of uh, uh, corruption and anti-Tamil posture. So I am not very sure if in next presidential election, firstly Rajapaksha himself cannot be a candidate unless the constitution has been changed. And uh, it's not easy to change the constitution. But if at all the elections are held, whether people will go back and choose somebody whom they got terribly scared of five years earlier and therefore wanted an option or, or, or an alternative. So it's an open question. I'm not saying that he's, he's established or he's not established, but this is, uh, this is an open question. Now in that instability, in a, in a kind of a strategic environment in Indian Ocean, uh, India would not like uh, uh, anybody who is representing singular nationalism against the Tamils to dominate and somebody who is very close to the Chinese also. Therefore, uh, for India, I think the best option is for the unity government to put its own house in order and, and somehow uh, carry, carry forward. Otherwise, uh, I know that diplomatically we have opened our channels also to Raj, Rajapaksha, knowing that what happens tomorrow if we should not be, you know, seen totally out of the blue. Therefore, we do not know what happens, but this is my understanding sure. of India's uh, preferences. Sure. Ambassador, do we, pre do we prepare for an eventuality where Rajapaksha comes back to power? I have a slightly different take here. I think we've got to now propound a doctrine for our neighborhood. And that doctrine should be that we are not concerned with internal developments in any country as long as those developments don't impinge on our security interests. We have levers. I know the Chinese are in the neighborhood, but we have sufficient levers. And if we choose to exercise those levers adroitly, and I, I stress the word adroitly, then we can get this message through. Of course, there are preferences which all countries have for certain individuals at certain points of time. But that's a dangerous game. And I, for one, believe that we should really now uh, not use the word doctor, but uh, make, this, make this point to all our neighbors that your internal affairs are your affairs and we are not really interested in intervening in these affairs. But we will not accept certain red lines being crossed. Sure. Uh, what's happening in the Maldives is a clear indication hmm. of the need for such a doctrine. And this is not being hegemonistic because all countries, and we are a big country, we have security interests. And everyone understands in the real world that security interests need to be protected. Right. Right. All right. On that note, then, we'll slip into a short break now. Still to come, Pakistan's Supreme Court bars Nawaz Sharif from contesting elections for life. We'll talk about the implications on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching India as World with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Pakistan's deposed Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif on Friday became ineligible to hold public office for life. After the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the disqualification of two lawmakers, including him, was permanent in a landmark verdict ending the political future of the three-time premier ahead of general elections this year. The verdict was issued by the apex court while hearing a case related to the determination of time duration for disqualification of a lawmaker under the constitution. Sharif was disqualified by the Supreme Court for not being honest and righteous as he failed to declare in 2013 a salary he got from the company of his son in the UAE. 
In February, the court also disqualified Sharif as the head of the ruling Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz. In Friday's verdict, it said that under the country's constitution, no person once disqualified from office by the top court can hold public office again. In our next segment, we will analyze what political implications will Pakistan's Supreme Court's ruling have. Still with me on the program are Vivek Karchu, former ambassador, a Professor S.D. Muni, foreign affairs expert, and S. Venkat Narayan, India Bureau Chief, the island Sri Lanka. Thank you for all my guests uh, for still being here on India's world. Ambassador, I'd like to begin with you. What do you make of the developments in Pakistan over the weekend? I think the Pakistanis are tying themselves up in knots. Because this uh, judgment really is this. In their constitution, I think under Article 62, 62 1 yes. F, 1F, 1 yes. F, it says that uh, uh, legislators must be sadiq and ameen, trustworthy and honest. Now, the constitution itself does not prescribe or law, subordinate laws uh, implementing this, this particular article don't prescribe any time limit for of disqualification. So, uh, the Pandora's box is now open. If for any uh, reason, a, a minister, a prime minister, a legislator is declared that he is not Sadiq and Amin, then he goes. And this is an instrument now in the hands of the Pakistani judiciary and the Pakistani army. And in this particular case, they have been acting together. But let us not forget then that in the inquiry committee uh, that had been appointed to go into Nawaz Sharif's assets abroad, there was an officer of the IS, ISI and an officer of the MI. And that was quite unique. So they are together. The army and the, the judiciary are acting together. And it clearly shows uh, that in this particular instance, Nawaz is the target. They don't want Nawaz anywhere near. Uh, but in other cases now, the same particular article can be invoked and people can be just chucked aside. It can happen to Shahbaz. It's unlikely because Shahbaz has good relations with the army. Uh, today, Imran Khan is all right. Tomorrow, Imran Khan may go. Uh, it may be invoked against the PPP or, or against anyone. Uh, so, I think the Pakistanis now need to do very serious introspection uh, because of this judgment. And I think within Pakistani civil society and the, as it's clear from the mainstream media that there is a lot of uh, churning on this. Not that Nawaz Sharif is, uh, is the point. It is, uh, I think the term being used is the judicialization of politics. Yes. That is what I've read. Yes. And, uh, but my last point is that uh, the army is again, as always got its way in this instance, though what the next elections will show, throw up is a question mark because the PMLN can't be ruled out, hmm. especially in the Punjab. Okay, you can't rule them, PM, you can't rule out the PLMN is what you're saying. Uh, Professor, you know, what kind of political implications is this judgment going to have on the ground in Pakistan? What kind of a reaction are we going to see from the civil society? Well, the, the, you know, uh, Vivek has been underlining about the people of Pakistan. I think the real deciders, as he said rightly, is the army, not the people of Pakistan. And the real question, polarization is along, whether you want the civilian government to run its uh, course or not. And to what extent the, uh, you know, uh, barricades which are being erected through judiciary or through army in one form or the other uh, should be legitimized and accepted. So in future course of, I think Nawaz has uh, left nobody in doubt uh, uh, that he will fight it out. Uh, how he fights it out is only territory is the uh, civil constituencies and therefore in elections his party there are some divisions within his own family, between him and his brothers. There are nuances of differences, but that apart. The real issue will come whether we will let the army dictate the terms of a political uh, structure or not. And that is the issue which will come up in the coming elections. Mm. And how it shapes up so far, and again, Vivek is absolutely correct, and we should all keep our fingers crossed, because army has a neck and capacity and resources to divide the civil constituencies. And they have been playing one party against another. They will play it again. 
uh, there are all kind of developments taking place in Baluchistan on on religious and other counts. There are problems taking place in Sin on on other counts, and therefore even PPP has you know the kind of statements which they are coming up uh, with against Nawaz shows that there is a lot of uh, playground which the army can exploit uh, amongst the political parties unless they get united. I just want to mention here that PPP came up and said that Nawaz. There was a proposal in the parliament at a time that this kind of a clause should be removed from the constitution and it should be amended. And Nawaz opposed at that time. Similarly, now is a case and, and if they are divided, if they can't put their house together, well, army has the capability to govern and dictate and they will continue to dictate. Yes, Ambassador. It's very difficult for them to change uh, this particular clause having once introduced it. I think it goes back to Zia's time the introduction of Sadiq and Amin. Hmm. No, because but the it, PPP at one stage tried no, to change I, 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 yeah. You are right. But it's difficult uh, because it is Quranic in origin. The rulers must be righteous. Right. Now, the religious right in particular will oppose this. They'll say, how can you object to something which is which demands that rulers must be righteous. But the army is capable of anything is what Professor Muni is saying. Yes, Professor. No, no, no. I said you, you are right. It is Quranic in, in its content. But it does not limit the time. You know, the issue at stake in judiciary was whether this is one election which has to be cancelled or it is for all the time to, and, and that is a kind of a scope where you can bring about or play with the constitutional uh, language. Sure. Uh, Mr. Narayan, what implications is this going to have on the upcoming elections which are probably due in the next few months? Yeah, the elections are due any time after June. June. Yes. <clears throat> The thing is, it's, it's very interesting, I find. Pakistan has had a history of 17 prime ministers losing their jobs before completing their term. The army, meaning Ayub Khan, Yahya Khan, Parvez Musharraf and Ziaul Haq together ruled Pakistan for 32 years. But the remaining period, even though civilians were, you know, in office, from behind the doors, it is the army which was running the show. Okay? Now, Nawaz Sharif himself is a protege of Ziaul Haq. Yes. You know, he propped him up to take on Benazir. And the ISI openly borrowed money from banks and pumped money into Nawaz Sharif's campaign to see that he is elected. And earlier he was sacked twice. This is the third time this is happening. But the point is, Nawaz Sharif is possibly the richest politician in Asia. His assets are more than $4 billion. And the, his party, his name is a part of his party. Okay? It's Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz. And he has absolute control over the party. So you cannot wish him away. He may be staying at the back. But his daughters, his son-in-law, his two sons are also cannot fight elections. They are implicated in the assets case, Panama Papers yes. and all that kind of stuff. But his younger brother, who is Chief Minister of Punjab, could possibly be propped up as the party's candidate. And through him, Nawaz may call the shots. So we cannot write him off, right. but his reputation has been badly damaged. We'll have to see what exactly is going to happen. In okay, next you can't year. write off Nawaz Sharif is what you're suggesting. Quick closing comments from all my guests. Yes, Professor. No, I said I, I, I want to react to what Venkat has said. It is true that Nawaz was propped up by the army. So was Bhutto. So Bhutto fought against army and Nawaz has fought against army. So let us not assume that if a creation is made at one time, for all time to come, it would be subordinate to the creator. And it has not happened in Pakistan politics. It has not happened in any politics. And uh, for in, in my understanding, anybody who is standing for the democracy in, in, in Pakistan uh, will, uh, will have support internationally, must have support uh, from the civil, right civil society. And therefore, this uh, disqualification should not be hung around him that, you know, you were as much a, a creator of army as it is. Sure. Ambassador. Uh the brothers are close, Shahbaz and Nawaz. So to that extent, I think Nawaz will retain a modicum of influence. Uh, but And he's popular. But I think his popularity will wane. 
because if a person can't hold office then the patronage that he can exercise gets drastically reduced and therefore uh, we are now looking towards a post nawaz period era era but that doesn't mean as i said that the pml n can be hmm. not because shahbaz will might now come into his own and it might be a kind of a relationship which was there earlier between nawaz's father abba mia who was a great uh, uh, who who had whose influence was considerable in pakistani politics through his son and sons rather so will nawaz may now go to raiwind and assume that kind of a role but he won't give up without a fight because at the end of the day he is a fighter but the army is the army in pakistan <laughs> he's been through quite a few uh, you know uh, adversaries or just, difficult times in the past yes just, just half a sentence yeah. what happens if maryam is propped up rather than shahbaz well then you have maybe having a split in the family well, it is already there correct so that i close the show yeah. for us you're concluding you know one thing yeah. interesting is happening while this political thing is going on pakistan general bajwa since december has been talking about the need to have a dialogue with india and uh, to settle all disputes in, including kashmir through dialogue so i have a feeling that the pakistan army is trying to send out a message to india don't worry about who is in power we still matter and we would like to make up with you and live in peace so uh, you know i i i i but, attach but, some but, significance but, but can we take it at face value there is nothing new in his speech which has been put out by ispr he gave it at the passing out parade of the of the pakistan military academy and i read it very closely he has repeated old pakistani positions and pakistan has been calling for a dialogue or starting a dialogue they are not saying that that they will end terror they are saying well go for dialogue and comprehensive dialogue so he has only reiterated known pakistani positions All right on that note then we'll call it a wrap on this edition of India as world I that I'd like to thank all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us uh, as always we'd like your feedback and suggestions as well you can send them to us at indiasworld.feedback@gmail.com you can also tweet to us using our twitter handles at frp09 and at rajasabha tv that's it from me see you again next time